covert DNA collection, human genetic modification, biohacking, gene editing, bioweaponry. It's all going on around us every day, but most of us know nothing about this shadowy world of genetics. From myself, Mark L. Watson. This is Double Helix. In a freshwater stream in Central Asia, a tiny minnow, only an inch or so long, darts around in the warming waters. His scales reflect the light from the sun, flickering silver and blue in the shallow water. Five long dark stripes run the length of his body, from head to tail. They give him his name, the zebrafish. He's tough as far as little creatures go. He can survive the relative warmth, but also the cold. He lives in fresh, flowing streams, but also in stagnant ponds. He doesn't mind whether the water's clear, whether the riverbed is sandy or muddy or covered in stones. His home stretches from the rivers of Myanmar in the east up to the foothills of the South Himalayas. But he has cousins across the planet, as this resilience, toughness and adaptability has made the zebrafish one of the most common aquarium fish in the world. I'm sure you've seen them in your local pet store, or swimming in a friend's home tank, or even a garden pond. But the zebrafish is more important to humankind than merely to entertain by swimming around in pretty circles in a glass box. They're also one of the most widely used living organisms in scientific research. Now, opinion on testing research on living creatures is a conversation fraught with controversies and one which has very polarising arguments. It's not one I will pick sides on here, safe to say that I respect both sides of the debate. We can talk about this in private if you need to. This conversation is merely to represent the facts as they are. But the zebrafish's contribution to science is incredible. They were amongst the very first vertebrate animals ever cloned by man, by the pioneering molecular biologist George Streisinger. They've been used to make highly successful advances in the fields of biology, oncology, toxicology, neurobiology, and they've been used in stem cell research and regenerative medicine. They're even one of the few species of living creature on this planet which have been sent up into space, and on more than one occasion. But one of the main scientific uses of the fabulous zebrafish is in the field of genomics, or gene editing. Now I'm going to try to explain this in a way which keeps it from being either a science lesson or a history lesson, but it involves a little of both. Genetic engineering, which I'm sure is a term you will have heard before, is the catch-all name given to any interference in what would otherwise be simply natural selection. It's been practiced by humans for as long as we've kept animals and farmed for a living. It involves, at the very base level, things like selective breeding, which have been vital for our ability to breed stronger horses, tamer dogs, fatter cows, and even tastier crops. But in the last 50 years or so, as human technology has advanced, we've found ever more successful, invasive, unnatural ways to alter the genetic makeup of creatures and plants alike, and it's yielded, frankly, incredible results. Now, gene editing, as I mentioned a moment ago, is a type of genetic engineering in that it's a way, a method of changing the natural way that the genetics of a species work, against the way that they were initially designed. 
With gene editing, a specific DNA with a specific purpose or role is inserted into the existing genome of a living thing. As I say, I don't want to go too deep into the science behind it, but you should know a little about how it works so that the rest of this story just makes a little more sense. Your genes, as we discussed a couple of episodes ago, are, are the sections or the strands of DNA molecules which exist inside the cells of every living thing. Remember, we share 99% or so with chimps and, for the research methods discussed now, about 70% with that clever little zebrafish. This DNA is the How to Make a You manual, including all the instructions needed to build a person or a zebrafish or a woolly mammoth. But the instruction manual can be faulty. It can include information which doesn't work very well or has been broken along the way when being passed down through your family to you. And it's these faulty genes, these broken instructions, which can lead to illnesses and diseases and abnormalities in the genetic construction of a living being. If that living thing is a crop, then the undesirable traits can be bred out of it. Only the sweetest tomatoes, the tallest wheat. The banana, which I told you also shares 50% of its DNA with humans, is actually a hybrid of other fruits the sweetest traits of one bred with the seedless traits of another. The modern banana, as we know it in Western supermarkets, though there are many others grown around the world, is a genetically modified thing. If the undesirable trait is in an animal, a domesticated creature that we use for our own benefit, then a similar attitude is applied. We can interbreed and crossbreed the undesirable trait out of the animal over a few generations. It's how we now own pet dogs. But altering the genes of a human is a different game entirely. There are now a few different ways of editing human genes, but using things like CRISPR, it's becoming easier, cheaper, and much quicker than ever before. CRISPR, and that's C-R-I-S-P-R, all in capitals as a word, is a genetically new gene editing tool and technique which has turned the genetic engineering world on its head. It works as a form of find and replace tool for the human genome by first identifying a portion of the DNA and then using the Cas9 enzyme, CAS9 the number enzyme, to snip away and to allow it to be replaced with a different portion. If you just left the snip, then the body would likely fix it by itself. But because the Cas9 enzyme is used to repeatedly break it at the same place, then eventually the gene that's been targeted just breaks or it gets knocked out. And then new DNA can be used to fix that break. Inside your genes, you have something called RNA, which is the polymeric molecule responsible for the coding or the regulation of that gene. It is... In essence, the part of it that tells it what to do. It can be in any part of the body, and it guides what that cell is responsible for. CRISPR works by sending in two component parts. Firstly, the Cas9 enzyme to identify and snip away at the targeted DNA. And then secondly, the new or the altered RNA to replace that part that's been removed. By doing this, one can either replace a faulty gene with a healthy one, which forms the basis of what's known as gene therapy, or to completely change the function and behaviour of that part of the DNA altogether. It's all a relatively new discovery. It was only 10 years ago, in 2012, that two researchers first published their findings that showed that the CRISPR-Cas9 application could be programmed with a set of RNA, this little rule book, in order to precisely edit parts of human DNA. They were Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier, and their discovery has garnered them prize after prize in the world's biggest and most prestigious scientific award ceremonies, including not least the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 2020, and a runner-up place in the Time Person of the Year in 2016. The medical implications of such technology are vast, and they cannot be overstated. 
It has, and it will, prove to be one of the most significant discoveries and developments in the fields of genetics, biochemistry, and disease prevention and cure that man has known, certainly thus far. It has great potential for treating a whole range of medical conditions, providing, of course, that they have some of the genetic component to them. So these include the likes of cancer, hepatitis, cystic fibrosis, diabetes, even high cholesterol. I've been speaking with Dr. Eben Kirksey. He's the Associate Professor of Anthropology at the University of Oxford over here in the UK and has written quite extensively on numerous subjects. It was his most recent book titled The Mutant Project, Inside the Global Race to Genetically Modify Humans, that partly influenced my production of this podcast and so I thought it was only right to reach out to Eben and we had a a great conversation where he shed a little more light on some of the aspects that I didn't understand as well and some of the things that have been going on behind the scenes within the scientific community. My name is Evan Kirksey. I'm an associate professor of anthropology at the University of Oxford. And um, yeah, really for about 20 years now, I've been interested in, you know, how nature and culture relate. And uh, that interest took me with my latest book to think about uh, CRISPR gene editing and, um, you know, how that's being used to remake what it means to be human. So before we go any further with the rest of the story here, I want to let Dr. Kirksey just take a moment to explain what CRISPR is in his words and how he sees it. I basically understand CRISPR not as editing, right? Not as something where you're working on a keyboard and you make a typo, you back up the cursor and and rewrite it. You know, CRISPR uh, is really good at at producing deletions, you know, can break the DNA code, um, but it's really bad at like, you know, rewriting things letter by letter, line by line. Um, Instead of editing, I prefer a different metaphor or figure. Um, I like to think about uh, the drone as as a good, good way, you know, the drones that the US military and others have used in warfare. So you give the drone GPS coordinates, it zeroes in on a site, on a target, and sometimes it hits the target. You know, sometimes it makes a precision strike, but often it takes out the wedding party and it hits unintended targets. And then sometimes your intel is bad. You give it the wrong GPS coordinates and it hits a random other person that had nothing to do with a terrorist plot that you're trying to disrupt. Um, so, so CRISPR works a lot like that. You know, um, you you give it this, these instructions. You say, you know, go go after this gene and and produce a break. You know, it, it, in technical terms, CRISPR produces targeted mutagenesis. So it makes mutants. Basically, that's that's where the title of my book comes from. But sometimes things go wrong. You know, sometimes you're instead of taking out a single gene, you're you're taking away thousands of base pairs at at at, a, at in a, in a, a particular um, uh, surgery. Sometimes you're accidentally doing away with the whole chromosome as as the cell struggles to you know get along with with this genetic damage that you caused. Um, so I'm I'm in some ways very skeptical of of these these claims that. CRISPR and other genetic engineering technologies are that precise. Things things do go wrong. But on on the other hand, I also see, you know, the human genome is full of errors, right? And, and, you know, we're, we're, uh, we only have about 1% of our DNA, which makes functional genes. A lot of the other DNA in there has other functions, probably that we poorly understand. Um, but over the course of our lifetime, you know, we're accumulating thousands of mutations. Um, we're, we're each born with about, you know, say like 40 mutations that we we have that our parents didn't have. So, you know, is it a problem that, um, you know, that these experiments are inducing genetic damage? And, and in my opinion, I think in some cases, the technical risks of these tools 
are being overemphasized and the societal risks are being underemphasized. We're not thinking enough about questions of equity and justice, and we're thinking too much about the technological details. The American Society for Human Genetics says that, quote, in March of 2020, scientists reported that for the first time, they used CRISPR to edit a gene while it was still inside an individual's body. The treatment was part of a landmark clinical trial to cure blindness caused by a rare genetic disorder. Doctors injected the components of CRISPR directly into a patient's eye where it's hoped that the gene editing tool will fix the genetic defect causing the blindness. If this attempt proves safe, the ASHG say, doctors plan to test it on more patients. Another recent clinical trial, they go on to say, demonstrated the safety of using CRISPR to combat cancer. Researchers removed immune cells from three cancer patients, used CRISPR to make genetic modifications to improve anti-tumor immunity, and then administered the engineered cells back into the patients. While this treatment, at best, kept cancer stable, it paves the way for future trials of CRISPR-engineered cancer immunotherapies. The positives are numerous. In the USA, a growing company called Synthago is championing the CRISPR-Cas9 process as loud as anyone. Synthago is a genome engineering company that enables the acceleration of life science research. Synthago, they're proud to tell you, is at the forefront of innovation, enabling the next generation of medicines by delivering genome editing at an unprecedented scale. They too have their own podcast, and episode number 30 of the show, which was actually released last July, interviews Dr. Jesse Bohm. He's the principal investigator at the Broad Institute and the chief science officer at Breakthrough Cancer, an incredible collaboration between five of the leading cancer research centres in the world. For the past 15 years, he'd worked at the Broad Institute's cancer programme as an institute scientist and as the lead scientist on the Cancer Dependency Map programme, a fascinating and highly promising tracker tool for better treating cancers and even more crucially, rare cancers that we know less about. In their podcast, The CRISPR Cuts Show, he states that, quote, what we're seeing is CRISPR having a transformative effect in the laboratory as a cancer research tool. What a researcher can do today, he goes on to claim, using his or her hands with CRISPR exceeds what could have been done 10 years ago, 20 years ago, by three or four orders of magnitude. They can block 10,000, 20,000, maybe even 100,000 genetic elements in the genome or the genes in just a month or so, and that would have taken hundreds and hundreds of careers just 10 years ago. While there are many success stories of CRISPR, and it is quite rightly seen as a major new step in the scientific world, the problem lies therein. It's a new development. Trials are still very much underway. So my mom had breast cancer and I watched her go through chemotherapy. She lost her hair. Um, she went through radiation and surgery. And as I was doing research for this book, the world's first gene therapy was approved. And this was not for breast cancer, but another kind of cancer, leukemia. And when they priced that drug, uh, they broke all kinds of records. It, it, it was given a, a price tag of $475,000 for a single dose. And, you know, I, I know viscerally what it means to suffer from cancer. And I know, um, you know, how revolutionary that gene therapy is. You know, if, if I had a kid with leukemia, I would be fighting to get them a Kimraya dose. But I can't necessarily afford, even as a professor at Oxford, you know, something that's basically the, the cost of a house. And the people who went through these clinical trials um, in the book, I profile a young boy um, named Nick, and one of the first questions his parents had, you know, am I going to have to mortgage my house to get onto this clinical trial? So, so now this, this drug exists, and there's more uh, gene therapies that have been approved since, um, one with a, a $2.1 million price tag. 
And a, a lot of families are, are having to choose between debilitating debt, you know, a, a life of living with a kind of debt, like, you know, most families these days can't imagine buying a $2 million house, you know, some, some of us can, but not many. Um, so what does it mean to have a child that, you know, when it's two months old or six months old, you're, you're told the only way that this kid is going to live is if you sign up for this very expensive gene therapy. So, you know, these therapies do have promise, but I, I think we really need to be critical about the pricing structures and whether or not we can afford as a society to buy into this new new regime of, of medical inequality. This is this is radically changing the face of medicine, but also radically changing, you know, the future in, in terms of who has access to this medicine. In 2015, a baby girl called Layla Richards, only a year old, became the first person in the world to be treated with these new designer cells. She'd battled acute leukemia for almost the entire year that she'd been alive, and her body had not reacted well to any of the conventional treatment. She'd several rounds of chemotherapy and eventually a bone marrow transplant to replace the damaged blood cells in her body. But within weeks, the disease returned. The doctors all but gave up hope, and the professional suggestion to her parents was unfortunately that of palliative care. But they were not ready to accept that as their only option, and they pushed the medical staff to explore every option possible, and to look at what ideas there may be that were less conventional, even if it meant that they tried something which had never been attempted before. Thankfully for young Layla Richards, she was a patient at Great Ormond Street Hospital in London, arguably the finest children's medical facility on the planet, and one I extend a very personal love towards. And the doctors there had an ace up their sleeve. You see, they'd been working on a very experimental cell-based treatment for leukaemia, and whilst the initial findings were positive and that the modified cells did indeed have an anti-cancer effect, it had only ever been trialled on mice. An urgent medical ethics committee needed to be gathered to grant approval, and the parents were told that there was absolutely no guarantee of it even working. Eventually, the procedure went ahead, and the predictions were that, should the treatment be successful, then little Layla would likely come out in a rash. A couple of weeks went by, with no sign of the rash. And then, just as she was about to be sent home, it appeared... A few weeks later, the consultant called Layla's mother with an update. Can you sit down? The consultant asked on the phone. Layla's mother assumed the worst. It's worked, they said. Little Layla was clear of the leukaemia which had plagued her body for basically her entire life and so enabled Great Ormond Street to perform a second bone marrow transplant replacing her entire blood and immune system. Within a month, she was discharged from hospital, healthy and well, and was able to go home to start, finally, her happy life. But, and let's not take anything away from these incredible, heartwarming, groundbreaking stories such as these, but these medical and scientific advances are still in their infancy. The practical and technical barriers that exist before procedures such as these can be more commonplace are very high. A great number of difficult conversations between scientists, medical professionals, policymakers within private and public medical care still need to be had. The genes which are being engineered, so to speak, are for the most part what are called somatic genes. These are all the cells which form the body of a living organism, but, and this is important, they exclude the reproductive cells. It's the somatic cells which can cause the likes of little Layla's leukemia, and changing them or editing them only changes the body of the individual patient. Nothing from the edited cell or the edited function of the gene can be passed down to that patient's offspring. The reproductive cells, which by contrast are the genes that are passed down from parent to child, are called the germline cells. 
Now, because any changes made to the germline cells through the process of gene editing will be passed down from generation to generation, it raises a host of questions which must be resolved before the hasty development of CRISPR can go too much further. One of those difficult conversations, which has already begun polarising the boardrooms and laboratories, is the murky debate on ethics. CRISPR-Cas9 is not refined, certainly not anywhere close to as neatly as some may wish. It can lead to what are called off-target effects. This means that when there are unintended changes made as the result of the process to parts of the genome which are not the original target of the procedure, the effects on these innocent bystander cells have not been researched. Each one behaves differently and so any side effect or knock-on effect can be very varied indeed. We also don't know, due to the shortness of its lifespan so far, what longer-term effects it may have. Now, reasonable scientific research will say none, but scientists themselves will admit that they're not always right. Far from it. The conversation, the debate, is not new, and it existed before the newest discoveries of the CRISPR-Cas9 processes by Jennifer Doudner and Emmanuel Charpentier. In fact, many governments have already legislated against the artificial modification of germline cells. The National Institute of Health in the US stated that it would not fund, quote, any use of gene editing technologies in human embryos, as, again, quote, the concept of altering the human germline in embryos for clinical purposes raises serious and unquantifiable safety issues. A September 2020 report from a group of medical professionals and professors in Germany, published to BMC Medical Ethics, explains in some depth the problem faced when looking at the longer-term picture of application of the gene modification, especially to germline cells. The report states that, quote, with the recent advancements of the CRISPR-Cas9 technology, it seems within reach that risks for the life and health of human embryos can be minimised to an acceptable level. So, despite what hurdles it may face, the path ahead looks promising for the world of gene therapy. As Dr. Jesse Bohm said, the speed at which advances are being made staggers the mind compared to what was possible only a few years back. Of course, there are conversations still to be had. There are concerns, there are medical inefficiencies that need to be overcome. It's likely to be a good few years still before this type of technology is being used routinely on human patients. But it's coming. What is it that makes it so expensive? So in part, it's, it's just the company deciding to price it that way. So uh, these drugs are built on a history of knowledge, much of which has been funded by you know, government agencies. So the National Science Foundation, um, you know, the Wellcome Trust here in the UK. And uh, these companies, though, are, are claiming in order for them to be profitable, they, they have to fund their future research endeavors. But I, I really think, you know, those of us who pay taxes and are indirectly funding this research, you know, we have a claim on this knowledge, too. It wasn't just produced by industry. It's largely produced through public-private partnerships. So, you know, some, some of these, these gene therapies do have a somewhat um, labor-intensive pipeline. You need clean facilities, you need to grow cell lines, but it's not, you know, $2.1 million worth of special work that needs to be done. It's not $475,000 work of special work that needs to be done. Um, you know, these, these uh, 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 drugs could, could be manufactured at scale by distributed facilities. And, and what we're seeing instead is that big companies like Novartis are being very protective of what they claim is their intellectual property. Though, for all its merits, and of course there are so many, the world of genetic engineering has a thriving dark side. You see, it's not only the medical professionals, the biologists, the physicians, the doctors, who are using the CRISPR-Cas9 technology to modify human cells. Oh, absolutely not. CRISPR kits, as they're called, 
ready-made boxes, including all the necessary tools and equipment necessary to put into a human body, can be ordered online and mailed right to your door. All perfectly legally. So now any of us, for whatever reason, with whatever moral standpoint, can begin the journey to genetic engineering in our own homes. The possibilities for mistakes and for abuse are inconceivably large and it's already begun. But what genes would the average, otherwise healthy individual wish to modify in themselves? Well, of course, the possibilities are vast. Your genes control every single part of you, so which part of you would you wish to change if you had the option? Eye colour? Skin colour? Muscle mass? Lung capacity? There's emerging research into how to change personality genes too, such as aggression and anger, or conversely, even altruism. Is it safe? Well, on the surface, yes, but who knows longer term? There's nothing to guarantee that 30 years after injecting CRISPR to change one's eye colour that it doesn't lead to cataracts, for example. We don't think it does, but it hasn't been trialled, it hasn't been tested, and it hasn't been around long enough to know firsthand anyway. So it's just impossible to say. The all-inclusive kits can be delivered to your door in only a few days and for an incredibly cheap price from less than $100 a go, so it's become a very real possibility for most of us who wish to give it a try. And that really is all it comes down to. You don't need a medical license. Hell, you don't even need approval from your GP. Just go online, pick your poison, pay your money, and you're in terrifying. It's only a matter of time before disaster strikes. Trust me. There have already been numerous cases of people self-injecting the CRISPR-Cas9 concoction into themselves in the name of research or in the name of performing public stunts. Now it's important to remember that it's only changing things at a single cell level, so it's going to take a lot more than one kit to boost your muscles or change your skin tone. No one's claiming for a moment that this technology works to do those things, or even whether trying to change those things would ever work. But the equipment can be sent to your door for you to play with regardless. And nobody would be standing next to you to make sure that you didn't get something wrong, something that may cause significant or lasting damage. Joe Zayner, a biohacker and scientist who's best known for his self-experimentation, spoke with The Atlantic about injecting himself with CRISPR in the name of research and, to be honest, perhaps entertainment. We'll go into biohacking in much more detail a little later in the series, but you can likely guess from the name what it involves. Zayner said that what the CRISPR revolution has become with its readily accessible home delivery application is a, quote, way for people to get press and get publicity and to get famous, himself, of course, included. But that, quote, people are going to get hurt. There's no doubt in my mind, Zayna states, that someone is going to end up hurt eventually. He self-administered CRISPR with the goal of disrupting his own muscle mass, and he goes on to explain a little more about what it was that he was doing. I wasn't trying necessarily to genetically modify myself, he says. I don't want to genetically modify myself at the moment, so many people ask me, to do it on camera, and I'm like, are you crazy? I'm not injecting myself for TV. I didn't intend for it to be this way. I was doing it to try to provoke people in the industry. It was at Sin Bio Beta, which is a synthetic biology industry meeting held annually in California. Quote, to provoke people in the industry who are in regulation, people who are involved in ethics, to think about what is holding us back. It's a rather dramatic point to make. But if it helps to provide a wake-up call to the administrations who regulate and govern such things, 
then it's becoming seriously overdue. As we said a little earlier, changes to the germline DNA which passed down through generations could go on mutating without the consent of your children or your children's children. Scientists are already worried that modifying the genome in this way could produce unintended and irreversible mutations. And we also don't know, regardless of what the scientists may assure you of, what impact can be had on the CRISPR if, for example, you decide to deliberately misuse it to create something entirely new? A mutant bacteria, a virus perhaps. And whilst my strong recommendation is that you absolutely don't go online and order yourself a kit, try to best put it all together in the manner set out in the instructions and then syringe it into your unsuspecting body, Legally, you are quite entitled to do so. Just don't blame me when it all goes wrong. The genetic modification capabilities of CRISPR and any other type of gene editing techniques are quite limited in living humans. As I said, the Cas9 enzyme is only snipping away at tiny bits of DNA at a sub-cell level. Changes can be made, and damage can certainly be done, but it takes time to affect any real edits. It's possible to fight disease, to change parts of a faulty genome, but to change the colour of the skin or the eyes or to build muscle mass, as in the case of Joe Zayner, is really quite a difficult challenge. That's because once a human has been made, it's very difficult to fundamentally change it. Your pigments are dictated by your genes, but once the pigment for the eye colour, for example, has been released, once the eyes have actually been coloured, changing them is a massive thing. You can't just inject a bit of blue-coloured CRISPR in and expect it to do anything. The original colour would need to be removed first, anyway. But to genetically modify the colour of a human's eyes before it's born, well, that's a different story. Your genes may already dictate that you will have brown eyes, for example. But at the embryo level, to a point, the eye is not yet brown. So if that gene was modified at that early stage in the embryo, then the command to make the eye blue, for example, can be inserted, and then eye colour could be changed quite easily. But genetically modifying the genes of an unborn child is a controversial practice to say the least. Doctors are able to perform such things when presented with information about disease or through the process of genetic diagnosis, especially for IVF parents. But creating tailor-made designer babies with your choice of features and colours as though you're choosing a new car is a widely criticised and frankly horrific concept. Who would genetically enhance a baby, though? What science lab would allow a person to perform such Mary Shelley-esque horror? Well, I would think, as you've listened to four episodes of this podcast so far, that you may indeed know the answer to that already. Double Helix was written and produced by myself, Mark Watson. Sound design is produced with credit to Looper Man and Pixabay. I'd like to thank everyone who contributed to the show, and to all my guests who kindly gave up time from their busy schedules to speak with us. And I'd like to thank you, too, the listener. Without your support, none of this would be possible. You can find more content and follow my work at marklwatson.co.uk or by searching anywhere online. Thank you for listening, and please go and dig deeper on everything that has been discussed in this show. There is so much more yet to uncover. <laughs>